Lord of Lords. We pray that your spirit would be present with us today. Help us see the the beauty of your grace that pours out on us because, Jesus, you journeyed from the triumphant entry on Palm Sunday to the cross of Good Friday. May we be reminded of your power made evident when divine justice and mercy met during that first holy week so long ago. And we pray that the power of your spirit would transform us into a church whose heart breaks for what breaks yours. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome to Troy United Methodist Church for our online Palm Sunday worship. My name is Andy. It is always a privilege to worship together with you. Um, if not in person, you know, I will take what I can get these days. And I'm so grateful for this means of our connecting today. Uh, but if, if, if you've only been connecting with us on Sunday mornings, uh, first off, oh, I, I'm glad you are connecting with us on Sunday mornings. Uh, but uh, 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 let me invite you to consider connecting in some other ways uh, throughout the week. Uh, this past week was our first week of the Daily 416. And, and just personally speaking, it was so meaningful uh, to me. Uh, 416 p.m., um, Monday through Friday on Facebook Live. If you have been tuning in to the 416s, uh, just to put, put a comment up right now on Facebook or a bunch of hearts, uh, a bunch of loves, if, if it has been meaningful and encouraging to you. Uh, I would love to see more of our church community gather in or watch those uh, videos later. Uh, you'll get scripture study, devotion, songs and hymns, uh, prayer, all, all in around 15 minutes or less. For many of us, um, I, I, I think I speak for many of us when I say it's kind of been our lifeblood uh, this week. Uh, so I invite you to join in. Um, and, and most of our journey groups have also been video conferencing over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and if you've been a part of a journey group that's met for video conference, uh, you know, sh share a like. Uh, let let uh, your church family know that, that you have not gone without connection for the past few weeks. Uh, and, and I tell you what, if you uh, I've noticed that those connections are more important now than ever. And recognizing this, we decided uh, to launch three new exclusively online uh, Bible studies uh, beginning this week. And if, if you would enjoy maybe having a 10-week survey of the Bible or an eight-week study on the book of Galatians or uh, of the prophet Jonah, uh, then, or, or maybe to even exist, uh, join one of our existing journey groups, uh, there really is no better time than now. Uh, feel free to contact me or uh, fill out your online connection form and indicate your interest in joining one of those online journey groups. Uh, but uh, most of us uh, most of you, I think, have been regular worship worshipers with us the past few weeks, and you know that we've been in this sermon series called Just Easter, uh, where we have been praying that God would resurrect us to be a church community that is committed to justice. And over the course of this series, I've been defining doing justice as meeting the needs of the most vulnerable and righting wrongs done to the most vulnerable. And, and that, that kind of brings up a question that some of you have thrown my way uh, about that definition of biblical justice. A couple of you have asked me, well, you know, Andy, isn't, isn't justice justice? I mean, why is biblical justice directed toward the poor and the vulnerable? Doesn't injustice sometimes happen to those who aren't technically vulnerable? D doesn't injustice sometimes happen to those who are privileged? A and shouldn't we, as, as God's people, care about those situations too? Well, believe it or not, this, this really is kind of a hot topic in our society these days. Uh, you see, this is the underlying question be, uh, behind the, the ongoing debate between Black Lives Matter, and Blue Lives Matter, and All Lives Matter. 
Uh, From a biblical standpoint, uh, God is a God of justice. So from God's perspective, justice is justice uh, no matter what. And it's it's a good thing that everyone, all people deserve. But when you study the scriptures, don't you find it interesting that that you never find God described as a defender of the strong. We're never singing songs and proclaiming the goodness of God as a defender of the wealthy or the one who brings justice to those with power. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about all people receiving justice. It, it just means that as a default, justice usually happens for the strong and the rich and the powerful and the privileged. They, they, they have status and means to defend themselves. So injustice happens less frequently to the strong, the rich, the powerful, and the privileged. But people with less including the sick or the widow or the orphan or the foreigner or the poor or uh, you might want to throw in there the the migrant workers or some single moms or uh, some elderly and and many minorities. These groups are more vulnerable to injustice because oftentimes they, they, they don't have the means or the generational support, or the social status, or the class, or the level of influence and power in order to defend themselves. They're more oftentimes the victims of crime, or violence, or corruption, and being taken advantage of because they are easily overlooked, or more easily preyed upon. So because they cannot as easily defend themselves God has a special place in his heart for them. That's why God is described as a defender of the poor and the one who takes up the cause of the widow and the orphan. God stands up for the vulnerable because nobody else does. You know, the last couple of weeks, um, I... I've been watching some of my uh, favorite older movies. Uh, can, I, can I get some love out there for other people who have been watching old movies uh, the past couple of weeks while you've been at home? Uh, I, our family watched uh, uh, Indiana Jones together. Uh, I watched uh, Top Gun in anticipation of the new Top Gun movie that uh, was supposed to be coming out in June, but just like everything else seems to be uh, pushed off and delayed for a few months. Um, and, and, and I also watched uh, one, of, one of my all-time favorite classics, one that I just cannot turn off whenever it's on TV, The Fugitive with Harrison Ford, right? Uh, you, you know, you, many of you know the storyline to this movie. It's, goodness, it's, it's, you know, it's almost 30 years old now. But uh, this movie, anyway, uh, the premise is this. Uh, Harrison Ford plays Dr. Richard Kimball, right? Who is accused of and, and actually convicted of killing his wife. Uh, the only problem is he didn't do it. He was innocent, and and almost the entire movie follows his pursuit of the truth in order that he might receive justice and that justice might be done to those who were responsible for his wife's killing. But would that qualify as biblical injustice? I mean, Dr. Kimball wasn't poor. Uh, He wasn't a foreigner or destitute in any way, shape, or form. He he was actually very wealthy. Um, He was an educated medical doctor. Uh, Of course, that's a fictional story. What about a real-life example? Um, I I recently watched ESPN's documentary on the scandal that rocked uh, Duke University's lacrosse team Um, about 15 years ago now. Uh, In fact, you can stream the 30 for uh, for 30 episode of this. It's called Fantastic Lies, and you can get that on ESPN Plus um, in 
any spare time that you might have. Uh, but if you don't recall this story that, that really just disturbed the nation overall, three Duke lacrosse players were accused of rape at a team party. And the media turned on these elite, white, male athletes, and everyone presumed that they were guilty of raping an African-American single mom student turned stripper. Well, under pressure, the Duke administration forced the coach out, um, canceled the entire season for this number one ranked uh, lacrosse team in the nation, uh, and alienated the accused. Uh, the prosecuting district attorney ignored compelling evidence in order to try and convict these three overly privileged guys, and the world hated them. But they were innocent. They, they, they weren't just innocent like they were acquitted, uh, and people might have felt like justice wasn't done. They weren't just acquitted. They were apologized to. Um, and the DA's crimes were so egregious that he was barred from ever practicing law again. Uh, the, the troubled young lady had been lying, and the evidence proved it. It, it was, by all accounts, injustice. But let's be honest. Um, these guys, uh, they weren't the vulnerable they had the means to defend themselves, and they did. And they were exonerated. Now, now hear me on this. Surely God wanted justice to prevail. But this wasn't biblical injustice. Even one of the accused understood this when it was all over. And, and he said something like this. I, I, I paraphrase. Uh, he said, since this could happen to us, when we were totally innocent, it shows me how easy it is for injustice to be perpetrated against those who do not have the means to defend themselves the way we do. That's why, biblically speaking, God's justice is not emphasized for all as much as it is emphasized for those who are most vulnerable. And you see this written all over God's Old Testament law, which if you're not familiar with the Mosaic law or God's Old Testament law, um, it, it outlines really revolutionary ethics and a way of life that is committed to justice, particularly for the most vulnerable. I mean, listen to, to just some of God's law that protected the vulnerable. These are just some snippets. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe. Well, why wouldn't you accept a bribe? Well, because the poor can't afford a bribe. And they deserve fair treatment. Uh, God uh, also removes, uh, God's law removes the possibility of generational poverty uh, by canceling debts. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, at the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. This is how it is to be done. Every creditor shall cancel any loan they have made to his fellow Israelite. This also meant that slaves were freed. Uh, people became slaves in ancient Israel when they couldn't pay back their debts. Uh, what's even more amazing is every 50th year, uh, it was a year of jubilee, where all land was to be returned to its original family that, that God uh, provided for the different family units uh, when they first moved into the promised land. Every 50 years, that land was to be returned to its original family. So, so you could, um, in that 50-year time, you could accumulate a lot more land and, and therefore wealth because of your shrewd and, and, and good choices um, and capitalizing on other people's poor choices. But every 50 years, that land would be given back to the family that lost it. 
You, you see what that means, right? It, it means no generational poverty. The misfortune and, and maybe poor choices of one generation would not be passed down indefinitely. Uh, there, there were also uh, gleaning laws. Uh, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. I mean, th this was so that the vulnerable could provide in some way for themselves without simply receiving a handout. I, this this was revolutionary stuff, folks. And, and it's really just the tip of the iceberg. There were all kinds of other provisions for uh, orphans and for widows, for the foreigner and the poor among you. Uh, the, now, hear me on this. They don't all directly apply to our culture today. Uh, but the heart and the intent of these ethical, social justice-minded laws they are relevant for us. I mean, these laws revealed the heart of God, that there would be no poor or oppressed or marginalized among his people. But alas, uh, through, throughout Israel's history, God's people regularly and repeatedly took advantage of the poor and the foreigner among them, despite God's laws. There, there were some who were righteous, uh, but many, many more who were selfish. And, and, and the Old Testament is filled with prophets who spoke rebuking words of God, but it didn't change the hearts of God's people. They, and they no longer reflected the, the character of God. In, in several wild turns over the centuries, God's people actually became the oppressed. They themselves became the poor and strangers in a foreign land and then really even strangers in their own land under the oppression of, over the course of years, many different nations. Um, eventually, in the time of Jesus, their oppressors were the Romans. And I, I share all of that because when Jesus came with his stated mission, which included setting the prisoners free, and then backed it up with miracle after miracle and revolutionary ethical teaching that, that the people hadn't really heard since, since God's law, since the time of Moses. I mean, when people heard this, the crowds, they got pretty fired up. So when Jesus came to Jerusalem on that, on that first Palm Sunday, the people went crazy. They thought that he was going to deliver them from the Roman oppression and and institute the reign of God such that there would no longer be any poor or oppressed people among them. So they waved their palms and, and they chanted, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Finally, a king who would bring justice and lead justly. And after arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus stood up for justice in the temple where uh, the religious leaders were at it again. They were taking advantage of the poor. He, he taught more about God's coming kingdom, but he never rallied the people to revolt against Rome. I, instead, instead of condemning Rome for their injustice, Jesus challenged the religious leaders about their injustice. And in a stunning turn of events, Jesus, who was welcomed with open arms as a just king on Sunday, by Thursday night had become the victim himself of grave injustice. And today, today is a day set aside in the church calendar to remember that, to remember that injustice that was done to Jesus, who is the only righteous and justice one. You see, after celebrating a final Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus was betrayed by a close friend of his, Judas. 
And he was arrested on the Mount of Olives by the leading priests and uh, the temple guard. And when they came threatening violence, Jesus said, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you would come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I, I was there every day. But this is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns. And then they took him to a midnight trial where only his accusers were present and they unjustly made up false accusations. The leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. They, they unjustly condemned Jesus. They wanted to kill him. But they didn't have the jurisdiction to do so, so they took him to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And Pilate, finding nothing wrong with him and hearing that he was from Galilee, sent him to Herod Antipas, the, the Roman appointed leader of that region who just happened to be in Jerusalem for the Passover himself. Herod found nothing wrong with Jesus either, so he sent him back to Pilate. And, and that's when we read this. From Luke chapter 23, Pilate called together the leading priests and other religious leaders along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I, I have examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence and find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty. So I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. Well, that wasn't justice in the eyes of the people, so they protested, yelling, screaming, crucify him. And for the third time, Pilate demanded, why? What crime has he committed? I have found no reason to sentence him to death. So I, I will have him flogged, and then I will release him. But the mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified. And their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded. Despite his innocence, Jesus suffered an excruciating Roman scourging. He was tormented and mocked with a crown of thorns placed on his head and forced to carry his own cross to the place of his death. And there he was nailed to the cross to die unbearably. This is the passion of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, which we're going to remember um, during a Good Friday worship service that we will have on Facebook Live at 7 p.m. Um, uh, joining in the suffering of Jesus, uh, I believe, is, is all the more relevant for the church in the world today. I, I hope you join us. But, but I want you to hear this. Uh, despite the complete and total injustice of the cross, an innocent man dying a, a horrific death. Uh, despite that injustice, on the cross is where the justice and the mercy of God perfectly meet. Uh, on the cross, Jesus, not only innocent of any crime worthy of the death penalty, but having never sinned, also completely innocent in God's eyes. Jesus, although completely innocent before God, took the spiritual death penalty that our sin required. He satisfied the demand of justice from God. 
that sin must be paid for, and the consequence of sin is death, separation from God. Jesus paid that penalty on our behalf so that instead of receiving the justice that we deserve, we could instead receive God's mercy. That when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin and our brokenness as great as it is. Instead, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. If, if we receive by his grace, by faith, in what Jesus has already done for us. And if so, if we do so, then the Bible says that we are, get this, justified justified in God's eyes by what Jesus has done. Now, I I found that sometimes people will argue about the need for this kind of justification. Uh, Some some of us are are like the expert of religious law that we heard from last week. He, if you remember, he sought to justify himself believing that if he tried hard enough that he could completely obey God's just laws and earn for himself eternal life. But with this belief, what, what he was actually doing was lowering his understanding of God's law, thinking that he could live perfectly, a perfectly just life, that he could perfectly love God and neighbor the way that God's law and justice demanded. He he didn't feel like he needed to be justified through anybody else. He thought he could justify himself. But some of us take a completely different approach. Some of us, either in our thoughts or just by the way we live our lives, uh, think that our sin really isn't enough to separate us from God. That, That there really is no need to be justified. Now, Jesus, Jesus didn't need to take the punishment of my sin because, you know, God loves us. My, our sin isn't that bad. But the story of the Bible is clear that we are totally alienated from God because of our sin, because of our injustice that we have done to one another and to the most vulnerable. So much so that that our disobedience, our inability to love God and love neighbor perfectly must be dealt with. That's why Jesus' willingness to stand in our place and satisfy God's justice on the cross and and offering us grace, that's why it's so amazing. That's why it is amazing grace. You know, when you realize just how much Jesus has done for you, when you needed to be justified and could not justify yourself, when you realize that, you cannot help but have mercy on others. Doing justice is meeting needs of the most vulnerable and righting wrongs done to the most vulnerable. Friends, you cannot not do justice when you have received so much mercy from Jesus who gave you the riches of heaven despite your spiritual poverty. When, when someone who has received so much mercy from God sees a poor person or a sick person, a person in need, he sees himself in the same condition that God first found him and yet had mercy on him. You know, we do justice because we've received mercy. We do justice because we received mercy. We were spiritually poor and God saved us. We were utterly powerless to help ourselves and God intervened. We were lost and alone and God sent Jesus to us. So now we do the same. We do the same for the most vulnerable. We do justice because we received mercy. And I wish that right now we could experience the beauty and the power of God's justice and mercy in our celebration together of the Lord's Supper, of Holy Communion. Uh, But we're not together. At least uh, we're not together in the way necessary to truly offer this wonderful sacrament of the church. 
And I tell you what, that that's um, um, even hitting me now. That that grieves me. Um, like I long to celebrate this sacrament with you as a transformative, grace-filling experience and a reminder of God's justice having been done through Jesus so that we could receive mercy. It's the first Sunday of the month and we won't be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. Instead, we're simply going to remember. Remember the power of God's justice and mercy. And together, we're going to go without. You're having to go without a lot these days. But we're going to go without and instead we're going to long for that which we cannot have at least not yet. And when we do gather in person, uh, whenever it's safe to do so, we will with great expectation and joy, we're, are, we're going to celebrate the ex- and experience the power of sharing in the Lord's Supper together. And, and friends, whenever that happens, uh, that's going to be a little foretaste of heaven. I believe it. Uh, but until that day, let us remember in our hearts and carry with us the reality that Jesus paid it all for us. Let us remember that, that though Jesus himself experienced great injustice on the cross, we can experience the power of God's mercy and his grace. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we enter this most holy week, entering it uh, lacking lacking our uh, sharing in the Lord's Supper together even. And as we remember the injustice done to Jesus so that we might receive mercy, Lord, it's my prayer that each of us would be committed to doing justice wherever and whenever we see an opportunity. That, Lord, when we see someone in need or some victim of injustice, someone sick, that we would see ourselves. That we would see ourselves the way that you saw us when you sent Jesus to us as spiritually poor, as powerless to help ourselves. You saw us in our helpless and helpless state And you gave us mercy, mercy that has redefined our lives. Father, I pray for every single person who is gathered right now online that we experience your mercy washing over us, even in this moment, in such a powerful way that we become doers of justice in this world. We pray it all in the name of Jesus who made it possible. And right where you're at, everybody who agreed said, Amen.